Hello and welcome to the Sapiens Podcast. I'm your host, Lloyd Waits. About five years ago, I had first gotten into MIT, and I was super excited about getting in and all things science, from, from computation to biology and to physics. But there isn't a lot of overlap in some of those fields. Um, so I was having trouble trying to nail down what exactly it was that I wanted to do and who I wanted to have as my advisor. And while I was thinking about this, I actually came across this Facebook article, believe it or not, about the synthetic neurobiology group led by a man named Ed Boyden. So I figured I just got in. Maybe I should try and email this guy and see if he emails me back. And he did. And I had a really great conversation with him about some of the philosophy of what a PhD should look like and some of the most important fundamental biological questions that is facing science today. Ed is a really amazing guy. He started college when he was 14 years old and then went on in graduate school to create optogenetics, which, I mean, mixing gene therapy and lasers, I don't know how much cooler you want to get than that. Um, And even though I decided to go down the particle physics path, uh, I still kept in touch with Ed and many of his students, um, and so I'm glad that I was able to talk to him for you today, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming and talking with us today. We're really excited to have you on. Great to um, be here. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're familiar with a lot of your work, but for people who aren't as familiar that are watching it, would you uh, would you give kind of a brief overview of some of the stuff that you're working on and that you're excited about? Yeah. Well, we have a couple goals. One is to really understand biology, like complex systems, in terms of their fundamental building blocks and how they interact. I trained as a physicist, and so I really would like to deconstruct complex systems like brains into their components to understand how the interactions between the parts yield emergent functions like thinking and feeling. And this is a couple of different feed-in ideas, like we need technologies to help us see what's going on and to control what's going on, and different outputs too. You know, Can we cure diseases like Alzheimer's and blindness? Can we develop strategies to simulate beginning with small brains and, and generate new kinds of artificial intelligence? And so our hope is to really, um, you know, take this arc of neuroscience and, and can we help it mature into a, a mature science through technology that lets us see and control complex systems with sort of ground truth level accuracy. So would you say that's accurate to say that you're focusing on these tool building rather than kind of trying to find like a full emergent picture? Or would you say that you're trying to do, you have a final goal in mind and are designing the tools to do that? Well, I think of this as sort of a 50-year program, you know? Mm -hmm. At the end, it'd be great if we can understand what thoughts and feelings really are. Mm -hmm. It'd be great if we can cure intractable diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and blindness and epilepsy. Um, There are stages of this program of research. You know, first, of course, we have to build the tools to see and control systems. As those mature, though, we are ramping up research, and we have a lot of people in the group who are working on studying the aging brain, um, studying small brains like in fish and worms. You know, if we could make a map of the brain, uh, could you try to simulate it, for example? If you could understand what changes during brain aging, could you try to reverse it or prevent it? So there are a couple of fields that are moving really rapidly right now. Um, Machine learning comes to mind. Stem cell research and organoids come to mind. Um, Are there any fields that kind of directly impact what you're working on and kind of you take advantage of any of this rapid development in these adjacent fields? Well, I think brain technology and bioengineering more broadly are omnidisciplinary fields. I mean, people like to talk about interdisciplinary science. We're seeing every part of the sciences converge into understanding and controlling biological systems. So in our group, we have computer scientists doing machine learning. We have people um, studying in vitro and in vivo systems. We have people who are clinically trained. We have people who are engineers, programmers, chemists, and so forth. One way to think about it at the current point in biology history is, you know, I like to think of brains as implementations of computer science concepts, but through chemistry. And so you have all these molecules that have tens of thousands of genes in the human genome, each encoding for, you know, potentially many biomolecules. How do they interact? How do they compute? And so, uh, yeah, this whole idea of of studying a computation in terms of its chemical underpinnings, I think, is a a powerful way to think right now. So uh, I know somewhat recently uh, you started working with the Bionic Center. You're one of the co-founders of the Bionic Center here at MIT. Um, so what specifically is your role in, in producing that? And what is your kind of function in forming a center? Yeah. 
So one of the core activities of our group is to build technologies for seeing and controlling biological systems, ideally at system scale, but with ground truth, molecular and cellular accuracy. And so these technologies are then feeding into all sorts of different um, centers and initiatives at MIT and around the world. So for example, there is an aging brain initiative at MIT, and many of our tools have been used to figure out um, ways to potentially um, you know, address brain aging or revealing data that could provide for future ideas of how to address brain aging. Uh, Hugh Hare, my co-founder of this bionic center, um, uh, directs a group at MIT that works on bionic uh, legs and ankles and, and, and so forth. And, and so um, our ability to generate ways of interfacing to the nervous system would connect very well with their desire to create bionic limbs that feel more natural, that couple to our neural inputs to our brain and receive commands from the neural outputs that go down our limbs. And um, uh, our hope is that a lot of the techniques we built, like for example, optical methods to control neural activity will be components of next generation prosthetics. So what is it like to, to build a center? How does that, how do you even get started with something with like starting a whole new center of research? Cause I know you've not only done this with the bionic center, but you also started the whole synthetic biology group at MIT. Yeah, and as a co-direct with Alan Jasanoff, the MIT Center for Neurobiological Engineering. I mean, centers can mean different things, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes a center is a building at a bunch of groups. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it serves a social function, like our Center for Neurobiological Engineering is trying to bring people together to innovate, and our activities include a conference they have each year. Mm -hmm. The Bionic Center is really a project, so we want to bring people together to work together, and that's what I do all day anyway. Okay, so... Uh, I guess, what's the difference between doing something like the Bionic Center between running a research group? Like, what, what are the different deliverables for a center compared to a research group? Well, again, there are different kinds of center. So the Center mm -hmm. for Neurobiological Engineering yeah. does not have a research program. It, there's a bunch of existing groups, and the goal is to create, um, you know, collaborations and communication. So it serves a social function. The Bionic Center uh, does have a couple of different projects. Um, our main part of it would be to take optogenetics, this technique we developed in controlling brain cells with light, and to make it more human compatible for bionic components. Um, and uh, our hope is that then that then connects with other projects in the center, so that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So uh, you mentioned optogenetics, uh, which was actually what first attracted me to your research. Um, and so, can you describe how optogenetics works and, sure. and how it, how it's used? Well, brain cells communicate and compute using all sorts of signals, but one of the most important ones is electrical signals. Uh, brain cells will fire electrical potentials called spikes, and those spikes then cause the cells to communicate to each other and integrate electrical signals to, towards computational outputs. So uh, how do you stimulate spikes? If you could drive a neuron to spike, you could figure out what it does. Does it trigger a behavior? Does it trigger a healthier state? If you drive electricity into the brain, though, it just goes in all directions. Light, in contrast, can be aimed very precisely. So um, what we have developed over the years is a tool set of molecules adapted from the natural world that convert light to electrical signals. They're genetically encoded, so opto for light and genetics because they're genetically encoded, optogenetics. If you put the gene into a cell, the cell will produce this light-activated molecule, a protein, shine light from an LED, let's say, or a laser onto the cell. That protein converts light to electrical signals that then activates or shuts down the cell. And then you can see if the cell can trigger a behavior or a healthy state. And so we distribute the tools quite freely, and thousands and thousands of scientists use them to discover patterns of activity that might help with you know, silencing an epileptic seizure or overcoming a Parkinsonian symptom or shutting down a negative emotion. And these experiments are, are uh, mostly done in mice. But last uh, summer, um, it was uh, reported that a group in Europe has also adapted one of our molecules to the human eye to treat blindness. And a person who was uh, previously blind had some partial functional vision restoration. Oh, that's really exciting. I hadn't heard of that particular study. But I've heard of uh, there being some issues in optogenetics that people don't want to use it in humans because of uh, fears of gene therapy. Is that still an issue? Or have I misunderstood that? Well, gene therapy, um, of course, uh, requires an invasive introduction of a gene into the body. Right. And the genes we use in optogenetics are from the natural world. They're from bacteria. They're from fungi. They're from plants with algae. And so uh, for me, one of the big questions, of course, and the only way to answer it is through a clinical trial, is you know, will the body tolerate it well? So in this case of the European team that took uh, one of our molecules that we reported in 2014, Crimson R, they used a gene therapy vector to deliver it to the eye 
of a patient with retinitis pigmentosa, a condition where the light sensitive cells degenerate. And over a, a roughly two year period, if I recall, um, the person did not have any adverse effects from the molecule. Now, it's just one patient. Um, uh, obviously, further studies have to be done, but uh, when you put a gene into the body, you do need to make sure that it's safe and effective. That's, that's really interesting. So, um, what is it like having discovered such a uh, influential technology that's uh, being widely used today? Um, if I remember right, you actually uh, first found optogenetics when you were a graduate student. Yeah, I was a graduate student at Stanford, and uh, I had uh, I was studying motor learning, and then I had a side project that was in parallel done with my uh, collaborator Carl Dysroff, and we. Um, we started uh, just thinking about you know, all the ways you can deliver energy into the brain. There's only so many kinds of energy you can deliver, sound and light and a few other things, but not that many. Um, and uh, then the question is, how do you make brain cells sense that form of energy? And so, um, uh, so I approach it very much like the way a physicist would, I think, seek to solve the problem. Um, well, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. And a lot of it was serendipity, of course, right? The molecules could have been toxic to the mouse brain. They could have required chemical cofactors that we couldn't synthesize very easily. But um, it was safe in the mouse brain and it didn't require any chemicals to be added. And so a lot of it was serendipity. And then when I started my group at MIT, one of the big questions is, can we do on purpose what previous generations have done accidentally? You know, can we be more deliberately serendipitous? And so we started developing lots of methodologies to explore a space completely or think of how to do the opposite of what people are doing or look for a failed project that we could then reboot with a new idea. And so we built a whole set of problem solving methodologies that then we can use to um, rapidly generate all sorts of inventions. So we, now we have generated all sorts of inventions for mapping brain circuits and seeing nanoscale things, ways of imaging many signals at once in a living cell, and all sorts of other technologies that I think solve major biological classes of problems. So I definitely want to ask more about engineering serendipity later. Sure. Um, but seeing how we started the bar so low as with a grad student project like optogenetics. Um, how would you compare optogenetics with, with other types of neural interfaces, like electrodes or the most commonly used ones, or even things like wetware? Um, so how, where would you kind of, what would you say are the pros and cons of using these different types of interfaces? So I really like to get down to the ground truth, the fundamental building blocks of a system and how they interact. You know, having trained as a physicist, that's kind of how we try to think whenever we have the luxury of, of knowing what those things are, you know, particles, atoms, bonds, that kind of thing. So in biology, you know, we have lots of biomolecules, tens to hundreds of thousands, probably more, and we have lots of cell types uh, that differ in their shape and their molecular composition and their physiological signals. And so what we really want to do is to image and control these complex systems in terms of their component cells and the molecules inside those cells. So for me, optogenetics is really nice because we can get down to individual cells or even parts of cells, and control the electrical signals right there. With the electrode, which is very powerful and, and simple to use, the electricity, of course, if you stimulate, will go in all directions. You'll activate lots of different cells. And if you record electrical signals, we recently showed that we could develop sort of the inverse of optogenetics, you know, um, fluorescent voltage sensors that light up when brain cells are active. Um, you know, with light, you know exactly where you're directing it to, and you know exactly where it came from. And so you can then go back and figure out what kind of cell that was. Oh, that, that was cell type 53. Um, it's hard to do that with electricity. And the other way, of course, that people try to modulate brain activity is through pharmacology, through the drugs. Um, but those also will go in all directions and affect, uh, affect things in nonspecific ways. Also, the uh, effect of a drug is very slow, right? You're limited by diffusion of the drug into the system, and then you have to wash it out later, which can also take time. Light, on the other hand, of course, is as fast as anything ever gets, so you can control not just spatially very precisely by aiming the light, but temporally precisely by sculpting the waveform of the light as you need to. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so uh, another big project that I know that you work on is expansion microscopy, and that's something that um, you've been very excited about and a lot of people in the group have been very excited about. Um, can you talk about that a little bit sure. and why you think that's such an exciting uh, project? Yeah, so again, we really think a lot about ground truth. How do we understand and control the fundamental building blocks of a system? Now, um, the genome encodes for thousands and thousands of genes. Those genes then in turn encode for lots of gene products like biomolecules, proteins, and so forth. All those gene products, those biomolecules, are nanoscale, and they're often organized with nanoscale precision. Now, it's really hard to see nanoscale things. Um, Electromicroscopy has been revolutionary, but struggles to identify molecules. Mm -hmm. um, 
super resolution microscopy has also been very exciting, um, but is expensive and slow and hard to apply to you know ordinary biological specimens in everyday science. So you know uh, again we have a lot of methodologies for thinking about problems, and one is to try to be as opposite of what people are doing as we can. And so we started thinking about rather than zooming in, which people have been doing in biology for literally three hundred years, what if we expand the object itself? And um, we, were able to, we were able to get that to work pretty rapidly. Um, we take a specimen and infuse it chemically with a material that's a lot like the stuff in baby diapers. We soften the specimen while we anchor the biomolecule to the polymer, add water, and as the baby diaper polymer swells, we pull all those building blocks of life, those biomolecules, apart from each other. And so it's a dirt cheap way that's very easy for anybody to do nanoimaging. Um, Already over 300 experimental papers and preprints have come out, not like reviewed papers, actual experimental papers and preprints. Um, so it's already spreading very, very quickly throughout biology. It's being used to visualize the microbiome, you know, neural synapses, um, you know, fruit fly brains, uh, worms, um, the human kidney, uh, you name it. And so uh, I think there's a lot of pent up demand for nanoimaging, because again, those are the fundamental building blocks of life. And if you can see them easily and cheaply, and powerfully, uh, you know, that you can learn a lot. I was going to say it's expanding throughout the biological space, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so why do you think something like this is important to understanding consciousness and understanding uh, these kind of emergent behaviors that you started out talking about? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm very interested in the philosophical side of things and, you know, interested in the human condition, what are thoughts, what are feelings, what are subjective experiences, were, what got me interested in the brain in the first place. Um, of course, these things remain mysterious, right? We don't have a device that you can point at something and measure whether it's conscious or not. In fact, you don't know if I'm conscious right now. I could right. be just a very accurate robot, and the real Ed is off on a beach somewhere, you know, um, lying in the sun. So, um, so a lot. Some of these things still remain in the domain of philosophy. We don't have, you know, what we can't measure. We find very hard to study, of course. Um, and so, uh, but we can learn a lot about internal states. So, for example, optogenetics has been used to turn on or off different emotions in mice. Um, with expansion microscopy, we're trying to map out circuits that are involved with things like uh, emotional regulation or, or decisions and so forth. And so it's quite possible we could learn a lot about the dynamics that support the generation of an emotional state or a decision, even if the actual conscious experience um, remains something that cannot be directly measured. And so often in science, of course, we have to attack a problem from sort of a roundabout way. You know, in physics, you know, um, you might have to devise a very elaborate machine in order to measure you know, a gravity wave, for example. And you know, then you make inferences about, oh, I, I think a neutron star did that or whatever, way far away, which you can't see. And so um, so I think the, there's sort of a, a, a theme in all the sciences where to hone in on a problem, you sometimes have to attack it from different angles that may seem non-obvious at the beginning, but you can learn a lot over time. But to be upfront, you know, the, the exact path, of course, will have to meander. This is what I like to call true science. There's no recipe that if you just follow the cookbook, you're guaranteed, you know, a, a finite amount of time and answer on a certain day, uh, we might find very surprising things. We are finding very surprising things that might cause us to pivot in very curious fashions. So I think more of a direct way that I should have asked the question is that uh, with optogenetics, you can do it in vivo, right? You have a completely in vivo system. I could have optogenetics if, if I was so inclined. Um, but with expansion microscopy, it has to be totally post mortem. Hopefully expansion microscopy will never be done on my brain for a very long time. Um, so do you think that that kind of impacts the limits of what expansion microscopy can do? Oh, every technology has limits. And yeah, one of the limits of expansion is that it doesn't work uh, on a living system, at least currently. Um, well, it's fun to think about how one might do it. Um, yeah, but there's lots of things you can still learn about the structure of things, right? In fact, if you think about nanoimaging in general, it's almost exclusively done, with some notable exceptions, on preserved non-living things, right? Electromicroscopy is almost always done on preserved tissues. Uh, most super resolution methods like storm, um, you know, uh, work best on on non living uh, samples because uh, you're trying to average over long periods of time, for example, as you collect photons. Um, so uh, the trick then I think is to design your scientific problem so that works. So for example, um, suppose you watch a brain in action for a short period of time, like making a decision. You know, presumably in the interval between the beginning of the experiment and the end, the brain has not changed that much. So the static snapshot that you take at the end might be a pretty good representation of what the brain was like during that, that period. 
But if you were to look at something like aging over a 10 year period, of course, the brain's very different from the beginning to the end. And just having a static snapshot at the end might not tell you what it was like at the beginning, of course. And I guess you would also lose a lot of the things like um, synap- or the uh, kind of the timing structure of anything that would be going on in the brain. Maybe, but that might be something that you can overcome through clever Lots technology design. Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, actually with uh, one of our alumni, Fei Chen, um, he was one of the first people in our group uh, working on expansion microscopy, and now he runs his own group at the Broad and at Harvard. Um, we collaborated with, with their group on uh, a strategy to try to record neural activity into nucleic acids. So imagine if every brain cell had its own little hard drive and recorded its own history into a little digital ticker tape or a digital tape. Right. Um, and nucleic acids, of course, are one of the most prominent ways that cells store information in digital form. If every cell kind of recorded its own history inside, you might be able to take a static snapshot at the end of the day and still read out all the time information from earlier. And so we had a little proof of concept paper, although the time resolution was not, not good at all yet, um, but in, in Nature Biotechnology uh, about a year, a year or two ago. Um, and uh, now we're thinking about lots of ways to try to get cells to record their physiological history inside of them in digital form. So that again, when there's a challenge, as long as we can frame it you know, in a precise way, and if our goal is to get to the ground truth, and to make a technology that's easy to use, then we can try things out. And so this is whole ticker tape um, set of strategies is a very intriguing one. Um, so how do you deal with this massive amount of data? I mean, between you have ticker tapes, um, you have a massive amount of expansion. I, I believe you've said you can go down to proteins before. I, I think I'm remembering that correctly. Um, well, so in Nature Nanotechnology, yeah. we published in mid-2021 a paper showing that um, with a new polymer, we might be able to expand down to, yes, yeah, single-digit nanometer resolution. Um, and so, yeah, that's about uh, almost the size of a single protein. So with a bit more chemistry, we might be down to single molecule resolution quite soon. Um, but still, I mean, even if you're if you're getting down to that level of precision and you're trying to do information with ticker tapes, how do you store that amount of data? I mean, I'm, I'm from like the in the computer when you're done. Yeah, because like from a, a particle physics perspective, we're, we have a ton of like event rates and things like that. And there's a lot of redundancy that you can kind of filter out and you have different triggering and triggerings yeah, and things like that. But with biological information, I feel like you need to store everything all the time because you don't know what necessarily. Or now we do because we don't know what's important and what's not important. Right. You know, very often only by analyzing the after the fact will you see the patterns. Mm. Yeah, it's a challenge. And so our group has. Um, you know, collaborated with other groups and companies to, to you know, design custom computer, design custom software. Yeah, it is a challenge. And, um, and I think it's going to get quite interesting, though, because lots of people now are, are contributing computer science ideas to, to help. So MIT is starting this ICON Center, Integrative Computational Neuroscience Center mm-hmm. um, here at the McGovern Institute to bring together computer scientists and biologists to work on such things. Um, Companies and nonprofits are getting on board. You know the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative that Mark and Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan co-founded just announced they're putting billions more into tools to look at biology, and they're of course going to have a big data component uh, to that. So I think people appreciate it, and there's a lot of people who are are, are plunging into the field. I, uh, I I heard something interesting actually on my ride in this morning um, from Lex Friedman's podcast. I don't know if you've ever listened to it, um, but that. Uh, an individual neuron should not be described as a transistor, but should be described as a processor. Um, and that kind of that really clicked for me. I don't know if you would agree with that interpretation. Or it could be a whole ecosystem. I mean, <laughs> um, I mean parts of a neuron can do very sophisticated things. Yeah. Um, there are two groups, uh, one in Utah and one in Massachusetts, a couple of years ago showed that when neurons are active in the way that might lead to plasticity or the formation of a memory, they produce virus-like particles. And these virus-like particles that look a lot like the HIV virus, the, the protein that makes it up looks a lot like the gag protein that is the characteristic, um, you know, uh, one of the characteristic proteins in, uh, of HIV. And then tr- it can take genetic material from one brain cell to another. Is that involved with memory, with individuality? I mean, this is so different from what the textbook would tell you brain cells do. And that was only discovered a couple of years ago. Yeah, and so there's so many interesting behaviors like that. And so after I heard that, my brain immediately started going and thinking, what if you could, instead of looking at, uh, I mean, so much in like the ML world is looking into things like uh, looking at an entire brain system and then feeding it a ton of data and then trying to understand the emergent behavior. But what if you could just use a single description of a neuron and then try and repeat it over and over again? Do you think that's anything of the 
feasible trying to get a very deep understanding of a single neuron cell and then trying to do some kind of like recursive process to understand more emergent behavior in something like organoids or um, a multicellular system. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, one would have to look at the data. If the data show that you can explain the behavior, that's great. But again, this is what I like to call real science, where there's no guarantee where you just cook the recipe in the cookbook and you get, you know, pancakes or whatever, or casseroles by, by four o'clock, you know. Um, a lot of what I think the best biology involves are what you might call constructive failures. You're going to try something. It might fail, but you're going to see something nobody's seen before. And it'll tell you what to do next. And a lot of our projects, I think, have a bit of that flavor to them um, because there is no recipe that guarantees an outcome at a certain time of day. You might fail, but it'll teach you something that nobody's seen, and that will then guide you um, with the wisdom of what to do next. Okay. So in terms of, of what to do next, you've talked a lot about optogenetics and expansion microscopy. Um, and as kind of like an intermediate step to emergent behavior, do you think this can lead to things that are more uh, directly applicable, like drug discovery? or uh, I know you talked about a little bit about therapies that are being used with some of your collaborators. Can you talk about that a little bit more sure. as well? So we have this invent, discover, design kind of process. We're mm -hmm. invented tool like optogenetic tools or expansion microscopy or other tools. We give them away to hundreds or thousands of other groups that make discoveries of them. And then we help them you know, design practical things that might have positive impact on human human health. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that happens very widely. You know. One of our molecules is in clinical trials for blindness in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, optogenetic tools are used by my close collaborator, Li Wei Sai, to discover brain waves that clean up Alzheimer's disease. And then the teams under her leadership went on to show that you could cause the same brain waves by showing mice a flickering light and a clicking sound. And now um, you know, we and others are doing human trials of flickering lights and clicking sounds with Alzheimer's patients. So there's lots of examples of the invent, discover, design kind of philosophy at work. Expansion microscopy, right? So, you know, early in a disease, if you detect the disease, you can cure people better for many diseases, like a cancer, right? You catch a cancer before it spreads, and your chances of healing the patient are much higher. Um, but it's hard to get, detect diseases early because the changes are very small. So, with expansion microscopy, you can make those small changes literally bigger. And so, we showed a couple of years ago with um, a team of pathologists interested in breast cancer that we could help more accurately classify early stages of breast cancer. Um, after you expand them. So again, invent a tool, expansion microscopy, discover, work with these pathologists who are experts in diseases that I know nothing about, and then design. Okay, here's an algorithm that will process those images and tell you what the condition is. Okay. Um, I've also heard that you have some, some nanotechnology work going on with expansion microscopy kind of uh, doing it in reverse where you essentially design something in a, in a macro scale and then shrink it down using, mac, uh, using the inverse of expansion microscopy. Yeah. Um, how does that work? And what, what kind of interesting things can you design using that process? So expansion microscopy, we put in the baby diaper material, add water, and expand the biological specimen. And since that preserves nano information, we wondered what if you could run the process in reverse. Take the baby diaper material and add water to expand it. Then you can laser print interesting things in 3D inside of it and then shrink it down. And because the expansion is nanoprecise, we hypothesized that the implosion would also be nanoprecise. And it turned out to be true. So it might be a very inexpensive way of making 3D nanotechnology. Um, and so uh, right now we're exploring with many collaborators many different possible applications of this. This is not really my core expertise, so we do a lot of this work very collaboratively with others. But um, it could be that there's lots of interesting things we could make in the optical realm or in, in, um, in non-biological realms where having the ability to sculpt materials in three dimensions with nanoscale precision could be quite powerful. It's very different from the way, for example, that silicon chips are made, right? Which are layer by layer in a quasi two, two and a half D process. Um, so you're, you're obviously a very influential person in the field uh, that's done, had a lot of impact with a lot of different projects that you've, um, that you've worked on and you've produced. Um, so how did, how did this start? Like, how did you grow up? How did you get to this point that you're at now uh, at McGovern? Um, and being a part of all of these different centers and research groups. Um, what was it like growing up? How did you become who you are? Um, yeah, well, I was probably around age nine or so when I became very philosophical. I really wanted to understand the human experience and existence. I went through a religious phase for a little while and then decided that, you know, maybe we should try to do this through science to understand the nature of human existence and maybe make it better. And uh, yeah, around age 12, 
I started coming up with strategies. Uh, I started college really young. I was 14. I went to TAM, so Texas Academy of Math and Science, where they let you start college early. And it was great. You get to work in a lab. I got to work in a chemistry lab. I always picked problems that were at the border of practicality and philosophy. So my first research experience was in an origins of life project. We were trying to create um, building blocks of DNA from inorganic material. Um, and uh, yeah, that really taught me how challenging some of these problems were. And I transferred to MIT two years later and ended up working in a group that did uh, was trying to make NMR quantum computers work. Um, and uh, that was also really hard. Um, so both the origins of life and making really great quantum computers are still a real struggle. Um, and then, uh, yeah, third time's the charm, I guess. Uh, 23 years ago, I switched into brain science. And it turned out that my chemistry ex experiences from the origins of life project and my physics experiences from dabbling in quantum computing for a while helped me think of you know ways of ground truthing the brain through, um, through technology, I guess. And, uh, and then in 2006, I came back to MIT to try to put it together. You know, could we really bring together these fields to build the tools that would get us to the ground truth descriptions of neural circuits? Do you, did you have any uh, particular formative experiences, I guess, that put you on this trajectory? Um, so many, yeah. I, I, I'm the kind of person who tries to learn from from every every uh, um, every experiment, every encounter, and always try to absorb wisdom from from everything. It's hard to pinpoint just one, but uh, yeah, a very large number. Um, as a as a physicist looking eventually to change over into into bioscience, like myself, uh, what would you give to advice? You, what would you give for advice someone who was trying to make that transition from like you did from physics into neuroscience or biotechnology? Um, I would I would say it's important to copy the methodology and thinking of physics, but mm -hmm. don't try to copy the outcomes of physics. You know, I think people who go from physics to biology where they they think about the building blocks of the interactions, they try to describe it. Maybe you try to, to, if you can't get the data, you go build the instrumentation to get it or the technology to get it. I think it's a very useful way to think. But I do worry that sometimes, you know, in physics it's easy to get used to the idea that these systems are kind of simple. You have only so many particles, so many, you can write down all the laws of physics on a sheet of paper. Um, and, uh, and so I think there is a tendency to want simple answers in biology, but pretending the problem simple doesn't make it simple. And so, um, so yeah, that's what I mean by, you know, copying the methodologies of physics, but not the outcomes of physics. So what m motivated you to switch over from doing something like quantum computing into neuroscience? That seems like kind of a big jump. Um, was there something that pushed you to it or was it just interest? Mostly interest, um, but also maybe a perception that brain science might be, you know, uh, more tractable. You know, quantum computing and the origins of life are both really fundamental problems. Um, but the way I thought about the brain was it, it you might be able to solve the brain in terms of the underlying physics and chemistry. In other words, it's not a fundamental problem. It's a emergent problem where we really kind of know what a lot of the building blocks are, if only we could, we could see them with the right tools. And so... Um, yeah, and that turned to be a very productive way of thinking about it till, or up till now, anyway. Cool. Um, and I know now it's you've had a very busy schedule, uh, and that on top of this very busy schedule that you also have a family that I'm sure also takes up plenty of time. So how do you balance having family and, and children with um, having students, which are in some ways also kind of like children, I'm sure. Um, how, do you, how do you balance all that? Hmm. I've never lived any other life, so I don't know how to answer that question, I guess. Um, yeah, how do I balance it all? Well, I, I do work hard. I do try to... Um, yeah, that's a good question. I guess there, there are ways to, to balance things in a way. You know, and, and one way to think of it is that science, if one does pick things that are not directly going head to head competing against lots of people. Um, uh, a lot, it does allow a lot of, of, of freedom in scheduling, and a lot of freedom in work-life balance. And so, um, you know, if we pick, 
uh, I have a strategy I like to call orthogonalization. If everybody's going north, let's go west. And now uh, we're not competing against anybody, but if we win, then everybody else becomes our friends. We help them. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to the expansion microscopy example. You know, lots of people are building better microscopes, right? Faster scanning things, higher resolution things, deeper imaging things, multi-photon, light sheet, all sorts of hardware things. We developed a chemical process for physically magnifying objects. That doesn't compete against any one of those other microscopes. In fact, it kind of upgrades all of them. So we can kind of, by picking our problems strategically, um, avoid having to go head to head against everybody and just having a foot race against everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I do think it's possible to balance things uh, by being strategic, I guess. Um, so I guess we can talk about an- engineering serendipity and uh, how you felt about that. I know that you mentioned earlier some of the processes that you were looking into for engineering serendipity and kind of making these these structures. Sure. What are some of those structures that you were that you had in mind? Well, one thing that I think is very powerful is to try to have all the ideas. Um, try to make a list of every possible way of doing something. So we started doing optogenetics. We made a list of all the ways of delivering energy into the brain. There's light, there's radio waves, there's ultrasound or mechanical force, there's near field, electric fields, and magnetic fields, and that's almost it. I mean, there's a few other things, but it's actually a pretty short list of things you can deliver into the brain. Um, And so I call this method the tiling tree method. You can kind of draw a tree diagram of all the possible ways of doing something, and um, especially if it's a physics-y thing you're working on, the list is usually pretty short. And then the next question was, do you make, and so we picked light, because light is fast and you can aim it. Um, radio waves have very long wavelength. Near field things don't, you know, you know, you can't focus them very well. And so light was sort of the natural lead. And the next question became, do we make a light sensor or do we find one? And I became very fascinated by this class of molecules, the microbial opsins. I was just reading some papers a bit randomly. And um, yeah, we started uh, collecting these molecules from colleagues. And, uh, and then the first one we put into neurons and tried out worked. So. Um, yeah, so I do think you can build an intellectual structure that helps you organize your ideas, helps you make sure you're not missing something important. And if you fail, well, at least you know that you can cross these things off the list because you are being systematic. How generalizable do you think a process like that is? Uh, it's I mean, pretty you, powerful. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, do you th- what do you think the limits are, I guess? Because, I mean, obviously with more physics-y problems, like you said, it, it seems pretty obvious. How many different pieces can you put in? Um, but what about more broader problems that you're like, especially an engineering problem where there could be solutions that aren't so binary. Yeah. Well, in that case, it's still helpful, but just, you have to not take the, the tree diagram that seriously, right? Mm-hmm. It's more the effort that you put in that tells you what to do. I'll give you an example. I mentioned um, how we we have a bunch of products where we try to get cells to record their history into digital code inside them. And this in part started because we were making uh, tree diagrams with, um, interesting splits. And so one split that many people do is, do you have a wireless way of getting something out of the brain or do you have a wired way of getting something out of the brain? And lots of people are developing wireless neural interfaces and many people are putting wires into the brain. But um, one day I was just thinking, what if we, where do you digitize? Eventually the data has to be on a computer somewhere, right? And so where do you digitize it? Is it inside the brain or outside the brain? And I started thinking, what if you digitize it inside the cell? And so by making the split slightly different and playing with it, you can force yourself to have ideas that are not necessarily at all obvious. One, one thing that I've kind of wondered about with this process is that uh, do you think it has a potential pitfall of kind of this building a ladder to heaven idea where you continuously try and make something better and better without actually reaching the destination that you're looking for without a paradigm shift? So something like when Henry Ford was designing the automobile, people would have asked him for a faster horse. And so rather than going into genetic engineering and trying to make these faster horses, he went and made an automobile. Yeah. Um, and so if it's something that it's difficult to conceive about, I feel like it might be hard to have that fit into one of these webs, but that would be a very important kind of way to engineer serendipity is causing these paradigm yeah. shifts. Well, there's two other tricks that we can bring to bear. One is thinking backwards from the problem rather than forwards from what you see lying around. And so thinking backwards from here's the goal, here are the specifications, what some people might call design thinking, is very powerful. That's another heuristic that can be used to jolt yourself out of a local minimum and show you a different a different path. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I guess another example that's fun to think about is uh, uh, this heuristic of doing the opposite. If everybody's zooming in, what if we make it larger? What are the, the tricks we can bring to bear um, uh, that might propose something that's radically different from what we're doing? And that's not always guaranteed to work, but again, if one is happy with constructive failures, hey, we're going to try it out, it's probably going to fail, but um, we're going to learn something by doing it, and that will tell us what to do next. That's a very powerful way of, of thinking about it. In terms of kind of starting at the end and then engineering backwards, uh, I've heard you say before that your ultimate goal is to, I think you said at one point that you sat down, you wrote down when you were in, in high school or in college that your ultimate goal was to understand consciousness and how consciousness works. Um, is that still true? Do you still feel like that's your goal? I know it's probably morphed over the years. Yeah, I just find it mysterious that here we are walking around feeling feelings and feeling thoughts and feeling sensations and so forth. And, mm. and uh, yeah, I, I think that still is one of the most uh, interesting things that we don't really have any handle on. Have you made a, a web for that? I feel like that would be a very large web. Um. I've made many, yeah, and, but I think that uh, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is to look at the internal states of the brain, right? What's happening in the brain that's not you know, necessarily an overt behavior, but is, is happening behind the scenes. And this is one reason why I think that looking at neural circuits and their dynamics and their architecture is so powerful. We might need to see the detailed structure and dynamics of the brain in order to have any clue about what these internal states are like, because the overt behavior might not tell you much, right? Like here I am, and maybe I'm daydreaming about a rainbow over a, a beach, but you know the, my overt behavior will not reflect that conscious experience whatsoever. So, do you think there's anything more attainable now, like a kind of moonshot idea that would uh, be a, be provided with modern day tools and technologies that you've developed that could start us down this path of understanding what consciousness could be? What do you mean by moonshot? Like, uh, if, if you had unlimited funding and someone came to you and said, okay, I want to understand what consciousness is and I'm willing to pay for it, what would you tell them to put this, this that money into the... See, that's not how I think. Okay. Because I think you can learn a lot about the future of science by looking at the history of science. And if you look at biology, the big disruptive innovations often are stumbled upon or accidentally, you know, discovered, right? Penicillin, most famously. More recently, CRISPR, you know, um, PCR, right? Maybe the most run biological reaction on the planet right now. Um, that was because of an enzyme found in the Yellowstone hot springs, right? So, um, so again, it goes back to this idea of serendipity. I think if you look at the history of science, you know, these big transformative leaps often were not because of moonshots, at least in biology, because we're still in the art phase, right? We're still pretty paradigmatic in, in some regard, right? And stumbling across things is, is the way to go about it. So I guess the question then is how do you stumble across things the most efficiently? And that's why the tiling trees and the doing the opposite and thinking backwards, these heuristics I think are quite powerful. But um, yeah, I mean, in general, it's, it's, it's scalable biological um, moonshots where a huge amount of money is invested in something. It's fairly rare that it generated one of these surprises, right? You know, the surprises often come from people messing around and, and, and stumbling across things, right? I mean, yeah, if you look at CRISPR or, you know, us messing around when we did epigenetics or, or stuff like that, um, often it did start from creating the conditions that fostered serendipity. So do you think doing things like road mapping is, is useful or do you think it's kind of more? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, road mapping is very helpful because it can tell you what you know and what you don't know, what you should do. It also can tell you when you shouldn't do something, right? So, you know, if you build a roadmap, then you can cross off the list a whole bunch of things because you can use physical principles and mathematical equations to show that, you know what, don't bother with that. It's a big waste of time. Um, then you can save a lot of effort. Yeah, road mapping is very powerful. Okay. Um, so in terms of stumbling over things versus road mapping, is there, I guess, a way to create a roadmap to stumbling over more uh, more pieces. So, I mean, the first thing that would come to mind for me would be you said that uh, certain enzymes were found in Yellowstone. What about things like exploration uh, or exposing yourself to new stimuli that could potentially cause more paradigm shifts like this? Exactly. Yeah, so we often are building networks of groups that work together um, on different problems, and we learn a lot from each other. And, and uh, yeah, this has often laid the groundwork for you know, these kinds of serendipitous connections. 
God, I think that's so important. Another heuristic is to read old papers. So, you know, these microbial opsins that we put into the brain, the first paper published on this was in 1971. And then when we were using the, uh, the baby diaper polymers to expand things, you know, one of the key papers was a paper from a group here at MIT, Therese Tanaka's group, in 1980, this multi-thousand citation paper on phase transitions in ionic gels. And when I was an undergrad at MIT, Tanaka was one of the cool professors that everybody wanted to work for. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away relatively young, so I never met him. But, but um, uh, we, you know, that paper always stuck out as something like, wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah, so a lot of you know, reading old papers that have been forgotten is a very powerful strategy, I think. Uh, it's interesting you say that because uh, we did an interview with Sandy Petlin oh, yeah. about a month ago over at Media Lab. And one of the biggest things that he said was that the largest uh, contributor to innovation is not having some superstar scientist, but it's the infrastructure that's put in place to allow for more flow of ideas. Interesting. Um, so I feel like creating these tools and then spreading them throughout a collaboration is, is kind of in a similar vein of trying to spread the knowledge through having a, a greater infrastructure um, to, to literally engineer serendipity, except, I mean, in his case, he was talking more about roads. Yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, yeah we have an essay called Architect and Discovery, where we argue <laughs> something very similar. You know, you, you can, like an architect designing the plans for a house, you can build out a, uh, a plan for how to build the ideas, the network, and the, the processes that yield innovation mm -hmm. in biology. So uh, another big part of uh, trying to spread these ideas in addition to collaboration is mentorship and, and being an advisor. I know you've also been a, a faculty advisor for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, that, how do you feel about being a mentor and a faculty advisor to students? Um, how has that influenced your career and your way of thinking of, about working with people? That's great. Um, well, first of all, it's, just, it's a way to have a lot of impact, right? Because you can help people generate new inventions and discoveries, but you also empower them with the thinking skills and leadership skills so that they go off and start their own thing later. And so many people from our group have started companies, even launched entire institutes, you know, fresh out of grad school, um, become faculty all over the place, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, UPenn, you know, all over the world. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really, it's really exciting because both in the short term, you know, people are developing radical innovations that have transformative impact. And then once they go out on their own, they're building, you know, their own networks, structures, you know, entities, companies, and institutions. So it's really fantastic. And also I, I find it to be a really fun challenge too, because as a mentor, you know, my goal is to help somebody maximize their positive impact in the world. Um, and that means being very dynamic, you know, if somebody might be too focused, maybe you need to help them collaborate more. But if somebody collaborates too much, maybe they need to be coached on how to be more focused. And so um, I feel like it's an extremely adaptive challenge to be a good mentor, but a really fun one. And so it's like the ultimate puzzle in a way. So uh, this is kind of a fun, interesting thing that I found. When I was preparing for this interview, actually, I came across old notes. I don't know if you, I'm sure you don't remember this, but from when I first met you five years ago, and I found the old notes describing what it should be for a PhD project. Wow. Yeah. Uh, let me see. You had a spectrum of whether or not it should be philosophical or kind of turn the crank work. Uh, how much of, a, of an impact it should have, uh, whether it's, it's controlled or grounded in kind of a more um, widespread, almost kind of mythical idea. I don't know if you're curious to see them. But is it my handwriting? Yes, it is. Wow. So I usually yeah. photograph these and then archive them. So I yeah. probably have it on this hard drive somewhere. Yeah. Oh, and here's two photon microscopy with different colors. Yeah, I'm a big fan of these dialectical synthesis uh, sort mm -hmm. of approaches, right? It builds flexibility in our thinking yeah. so that we can pivot and go the right path to solve the problem yeah. without getting lost because we're always seeing the, the thesis and the antithesis. And then if you can find the right balance, that's a very powerful strategy. Right. Yeah, I... I uh... I, I I found those and I was like, oh wow, this is a lot of what I tried to turn into my thesis, and it did kind of impact my thinking, wow. even though I didn't end up going into into bioscience. But sure. um, still, just a very interesting thing to look back on uh, and very see cool. how it impacted cool. my my current work. Yeah, these thinking yeah. processes I think are learnable, teachable skills. I like mm -hmm. to focus on what I call learnable, teachable skills, and yeah, helping people create, helping people problem solve. I mean, that's really what I think doing a PhD and, and being a mentor of a PhD student is about, right? Um, it's not necessarily about the hands-on uh, hands specific skill, 
but uh, rather it's about doing what it takes to get the job done. And that might require learning a different field or collaborating with somebody you've never met before. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's all about problem solving, I think. At least that's how I think about it. Uh, with some of the work that you've done in uh, advising a lot of a lot of people that have had these kind of philosophical ideas and um, have wanted to eventually go and found sensors, what are some of the potential pitfalls that you warn people of, or your graduate students, or people going out and starting companies? Yeah, so we've had many of our alumni become faculty, many have started companies, and more recently, several are starting like institutes and nonprofits. Um, I think every problem has a natural home, right? If you don't need too much outside input and you want to own it all under one roof and you need scale and then companies can work great. If you need long time horizons, if you want to have an open system that collaborates you know, openly, then that might not be the best. Maybe academia would be the best place. And then nonprofits can fill middle ground. You know, what if you need scale like a company, but some of the openness of an academic environment? And so um, some of our alumni are starting uh, interesting nonprofit institutes and so forth that, that might be able to bridge some of those gaps. So for me, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I think there's sort of a natural home for each problem. And if you don't find a natural home, maybe you have to invent a new kind of thing. And um, several of our grad students in their thesis would write up a chapter about, well, if I was in charge of science, here's what I would do. And now some of those uh, ideas have actually led to new kinds of scientific structure. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm very much about the problem and thinking backwards on the problem. If the problem is we don't have a structure that gets the job done, well, let's build a structure, you know? Yeah, we uh, we recently talked to Adam Marvelstone oh, yeah. and and uh, Anastasia Gamak, who went on to do FROs. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's, that's one group. example of stuff that uh, that um, they pioneered, where where indeed a new structure might be needed, that is much more scalable than academia, but not mm -hmm. so short term as a for profit entity. Right. So, with the, these these kind of uh, problem solving methodologies that you've developed, um, have you tried to expand it to things that aren't necessarily scientific? Something uh, more something like an existential threat, for example, um, that I know is a big concern of a lot of people that work here at MIT or uh, adjacently into the people in the media lab as well. Well, in our group, um, you know, we did have a grassroots effort to devise strategies to fight climate change. And mm -hmm. um, MIT picked 28 projects where their climate grand challenge finalists each mm -hmm. got $100,000 to, you know, prepare um, uh, a document of, of a detailed plan, and two out of the 28 were initiated by people in our group or their wow. close collaborators. So, yeah, it was kind of shocking and maybe a little scary to think that we were almost 10% of MIT's climate change <laughs> effort. So, uh, and so then, um, you know, last fall, we wrote the full document along with many, we teamed up with many other labs, right? It's not just us, right. of course. Um, and uh, put forth two you know, fairly comprehensive approaches to how to use biology to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And um, now they're being judged and graded for the, the final final round of uh, the evaluation. So yeah, this way of thinking about problems is very powerful, and you can apply it to many things. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, recently we've been uh, thinking a lot about aging as well, um, and uh, you know um, we've built a couple of networks of and are participating in a couple of networks of groups that are working together to try to you know slow or reverse the aging of the brain and. Um, that's also getting very interesting as well. So yeah, I think this kind of way of approaching problems, thinking backwards, trying to be systematic, road mapping, seeking constructive failures, looking for forgotten insights, doing the opposite. These heuristics can be very helpful for kind of taking a problem that is very difficult or sometimes even stuck and kind of jolting us out of that local minimum so that we can have a new uh, angle of attack. Um, so with, with your working in aging, I've heard a lot of the time that uh, people consider it there being a hard stop for human lifespan being around. 120 years old, even if you could fix a lot of the other problems. Do you think that's no longer true? Do you think that's starting to change with a lot of the, because aging research is growing very rapidly as well? I don't know. I think in the end, what matters is the data, you know? My opinion doesn't mm -hmm. matter. What matters <laughs> is, you know, what do the data, data show? Okay. Um, do you have any uh, initial kind of basic trends from that data that you have, or is it just still very Our much at the design stage? Yeah. Oh, we're just starting the project. Okay. It's, it's very new. Yeah, nothing. We're, we're just getting going. Okay. Um, do you ever ponder your own your own mortality and your own kind of aging body? I think we all do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's inevitable. Um, and uh, yeah, that's one. I think a nice byproduct of this quest is maybe we can find ways to cure lots of diseases and and uh, and help lots of people. 
you know, for me, the, the primary goal is still very philosophical. I think we cure all diseases, but we still don't understand the nature of existence. I would personally find that dissatisfying. <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, if we can achieve both, you know, understanding what it means to be human and, you know, cure all, all diseases, that would be a great, a great combination. Um, do you think that mortality is a solvable problem? Or do you think it needs to be that consciousness needs to be understood first? Um, what do you think is solvable? Uh, do you think it's possible for uh, to create a system that doesn't uh, doesn't fall to entropy, that doesn't fall apart, that doesn't die? Mm, well, anything can be destroyed. I mean, if the sun blew up tomorrow, you know, the whole Earth would be incinerated. And right. <coughs> um, I the, don't know if any current technology we can imagine would survive that. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, barring something uh, kind of like a high energy situation like that, um, say we launch something into space far enough away into the vacuum of space that there's no way uh, an exploding star will reach it, and sure, eventually it will fall into a black hole. But do you think there's like a way that it can, I don't know, prolong, make a very stable system so that it doesn't fall into entropy for very long periods of time? So again, I think it boils down to the data, right? I mean, mm. I don't think we know enough about what needs to be preserved, what needs to be repaired, what the processes are for such repair. Is some information loss irretrievable or can you find some way to compensate for it? Mm. Again, I'm very data driven. And so, and uh, and I think that's probably for something as high dimensional as biology is the right way to be because um, there's so many ways for a theory, currently anyway, in the history of biology to, to go wrong. Um, so I think it's, it's nice to have hypotheses for sure. But in the end, I think we have to be driven by the data, you know, and that's one reason why I'm so obsessed with the idea of constructive failure. So we're going to try something. Most of the time it's going to fail. We'll still see something nobody's ever seen before. And they'll tell us what to do next. But it's very hard to predict beyond that, that first constructive failure. So where do you think it's most important to gather data right now? Well, I'm very obsessed with this idea of ground truth. You know, can we understand entire systems as their most fundamental description? I think in the history of biology, there have been many people study small things, like they'll study a single molecule, or who look at a large thing, but you know, um, at a phenomenological level. Like, um, you know, suppose, you know, thinking back to the early days of brain histology, you stain the brain, you see some some shapes, but you don't know what the molecules are, right? I think the the highest priority is to build tools that let us cross that gap. We want to see the system, the whole thing, and control the system, the whole thing, but at the most fundamental level of description. And that's why I think optogenetics took off. That's why expanse microscopy is taking off. That's why some of our newer techniques that we're building to do, you know, multidimensional live imaging of cellular functions, I think, are going to be very important as well. Because again, you want to see all these signals talking to each other at their most fundamental spatial and temporal resolution, but not lose sight of the network. And and so these crossings of intellectual scale or abstraction layer or, or all these terms that different fields have, um, I think, is really key. Uh, so if you are going to be gathering data uh, and trying to understand where these consciousnesses arise, um, where is the best place to look? Um, because, I mean, a lot of people look in kind of the AI space. A lot of people look specifically in the neuroscience space. Um, and then I've even heard some, some ideas of things like uh, in the ecological space where you have things like ants that are communicating like with each other as if they're individual neurons through in chemical signals, which are obviously a lot slower than electrical signals that you see in the brain but still form a kind of emergent consciousness through a set a sort of group dynamic. Um, so, I mean, okay, that's not something don't... that can be really found by data. That would have to be kind of a, I guess, a, a, a philosophical question you found on a chalkboard. Yeah, well, I guess the question, of course, is what can you measure and what can you describe? So if, if ants are creating some kind of emergent system by having many ants working together, mm -hmm. Is that consciousness, or is that you know more equivalent to um, you know all the people working together to to navigate a submarine across the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh, they all are working together to be sure, and the submarine is making its way across the ocean, but almost nobody probably thinks that the submarine is conscious per se, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, you know, is this just a metaphor or an analogy, or can we really measure it? Now, in terms of brains. Uh, you know, we do know some things about consciousness, right? There are neural correlates of consciousness, right? When you're conscious of something, here are some signals you can measure. You could perturb the brain and drive conscious states. So in human neurosurgical patients, you could stimulate parts of the brain and people will perceive a flash of light or 
you know, feel something, right? So uh, for the brain anyway, there are lots of clues that we can see things that correlate to consciousness and drive things that result in conscious experiences. And so that, I think, gives us a bit of a handle that suggests that if we did have a map of those underlying circuits, so we know how the information is propagating from the input to the output, maybe we could say something very concrete. Now, again, until we have that data, it's hard to know what that concrete thing would be. Um, and again, I'm very data-driven, and nobody has such a data set yet. But the fact that we can see things that correlate with consciousness at the physiological level, and we can drive conscious states through the introduction of electrical stimuli and other precision interventions. Um, you know, in animals, you can drive with optogenetics um, a set of neurons, and the animal will respond, um, you know, as if it's a, 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 a sight or a sound or whatever. And, and so the, these kinds of clues, I think, do suggest that maybe there is something to brain mapping that could be quite useful. But I don't know enough about ants to say, to say what would be the right experiment to do to prove that the ants collectively are conscious. So I guess is kind of a, a reach question would be, if I came to you with a, with a data set that had uh, complete neuronal, con uh, all, the complete list of all neuronal activity, it's a massive data set uh, of a conscious set and an unconscious set and the transition between these, do you think you would be able to look at it and point out this is where it happened? Well, we have to look at the data, yeah. I mean, some data sets, things jump out at you, and some are very ambiguous. I don't know. It probably depend on what the data looked like. Okay. What, would, what would an analysis of something like that look like? Or would, would you have to look at the data to understand what kind of analysis you think? I tend to be really intuitive. I really like to look at things with my own eyes and, okay. and stare at it. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think once, once we have some intuition for it, then we can try to make it more systematic. Now, that all the interest in data mining and machine learning is, is, I think, making some of that more automatable, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think there also is um, some concern that, you know, you kind of get what you look for, right? And so it can't hurt to take a look at the data and play with it. Okay. Um, do you have a, a favorite project that you work on now? Or does there, all of your projects get equal love? Well, it's really an ecosystem of projects, right? Okay. Because you, you know, no one project solves everything. So we need to see what's going on in the brain. We have to map it. We need to control it. We need to model it. We have to ground it in behavior, of course, because at the end, you want to know that what you're measuring had some impact on the output of the brain. Um, I really think it was an ecosystem of, of components that are extremely important that together will yield hopefully lots of insight. And then, of course, we have lots of applied versions of this too, where you know, maybe different from most other groups, many of our graduate students have co-advisors. And so you know, we have people in the group who are focused on things like schizophrenia, or autism, or Alzheimer's, and, and so forth, where you know uh, one of our tools could have maybe profound impact on revealing a new clinical target, or a new pattern of brain activity, or a new strategy that might help with a disease. And so that's very powerful too, because you know there's so many problems that need solving. If we can generate a core set of tools that then can be applied systematically across the space, that's quite important. And so uh, I, I view that as extremely important as well. So I think I've gone through all my questions Great. for today. Uh, I thank you very much for finding time to meet with us. I know yeah, you've been extremely you. busy, um, and uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. So thank Great. you very much. I'll stay in touch. Yeah, we'll do.